We're here preparing for the science of AIDS and understanding a little better what antiviral treatments are going to be doing at the Croy. Uh, we're not sure what the science is going to be. It's always a mystery sometimes until the until even the last of the uh, late breakers is presented. And, and I'm sure there's a few people that hang on to that very last presentation. But the important thing to do, I think, for us is to kind of get the folks who are less well-educated about the science a little more educated and get prepared about, and maybe excited about, the possibility of viewing some of the programs, especially the antiviral program that we'll be doing, and, of course, interviews. So uh, we're here with Jim McDonald, who is from Kaiser Permanente, in Portland, and we're hoping that he can give us a background a little bit on some of the things that we might want to be watching out for in antiviral treatments today. Okay. Well, Fred, I think that, um, I mean, you know, most therapies now, I mean, one of the things that is very real about antiretroviral therapy today is early intervention. So the whole issue around getting people tested, diagnosed, connected to care, get on therapy and have them be uh, maintained in care is very important. Mm -hmm. And of course we no longer have a minimum CD4 count or maximum viral load or anything for initiating treatment. Basically anybody who's eligible for treatment uh, and is willing and interested in accessing uh, mm -hmm antiretroviral therapy should be able to. So, uh, and I don't know as we know what the future holds in terms of, of uh, starting people earlier on fully suppressive regimens that have more modest side effect profiles because mm -hmm. we're not 20, 30 years out like we are now for guys who, for people who um, live with HIV for a number of years prior to fully suppressive antiretroviral therapy becoming available in 1996 and then going through serial monotherapy and multidrug resistant virus and all of those things that we're seeing in our uh, uh, population that has lived with HIV for 20, 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. Now do you say that with the, uh, with the uh, focus on, or maybe it's both ways, both the treatment is prevention and also the patient will do better. We're, we're learning both Yes, things are absolutely. Yeah. So both things are important. I think early intervention is important uh, because obviously full viral suppression results in uh, absence of virus in the genital secretions, which then hopefully mm -hmm. prevents at least sexual transmission and prevents injection drug use transmission as well. Mm -hmm. So the partners of people who are living with HIV who are well are fully suppressed are protected. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, the data is overwhelmingly clear. I mean, that's clearly a 94% protective value. Uh, but also, um, you know, we're looking at, I mean, we now have for the first time ever three single tablet regimens. We have a tripla, which mm -hmm. uh, I'll be candid, I've never been a big fan of because mm -hmm. uh, of the Sestiva component. Um, and I think there's going to be some new data uh, brought out at Croy that speaks to some of the cognitive impairment and um, neuropsychiatric complications of long-term efavirenz or Sestiva use, um, which I'm happy for because it just supports my point of view. But <laughs> uh, but then we also have Complera, uh, which is basically Truvada, Tenofovir, uh, uh, Emtricitabine with Rilpivirine, which is Endurant. And it's a real sweet deal. Uh, very modest uh, uh, side effect profile. Um, and actually, many of my patients who've been on a triplet for a long time, I am trying to convince them to switch to Complera. The caveats with Complera, of course, is ropivirine uh, must be taken with food. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who, for example, have been on a triplet for many, many years, and we've uh, you know, trained them to take the medicine at bedtime on an empty stomach, at bedtime on an empty stomach, when we switch to Complera, you have to take it with a meal, minimum mm -hmm. 400 calories. Mm -hmm. And it's also people who have a lot of gastroesophageal reflux disorder, acid indigestion, heartburn, people who use a lot of uh, H2 agonists like, you know, Pepsid, mm -hmm. famotidine, Zantac, Cimetidine, or proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, Prilosec, Protonix, etc., aren't really eligible for Complera use. It's difficult to juggle those mm -hmm. uh, because the quote-unquote antacid medicines tend to interfere with the ropivirine. 
But other than that, um, I know for myself and my patients and my colleagues in other HIV practices here in town and throughout the country, um, everybody's really satisfied, both providers and patients, with mm -hmm. Complera. And then, of course, we have Strybuild, which is the quad pill, which we waited for. They told us every quarter of 12 and every quarter of 13, <laughs> ultimately it would be available, finally became available in October of 12. And at this point, is only FDA approved for naive patients. Mm -hmm. um, and as always has been true for many, many decades for HIV treaters, we oftentimes do things off-label mm -hmm. because we have to. Mm -hmm. And so I have certainly used it off-label myself. Uh, like I say, it is only approved for um, new starts, new antiretroviral start, starts in, in, anti, in uh, antiretroviral naive patients. Mm -hmm. However, because it has the second generation integrase inhibitor, Elvitegravir, it has the booster, Cobicistat, uh, which has no anti-HIV properties like Norovir, Ritonavir, which is our traditional booster drug, does have a little bit of a direct effect on the virus. Uh, and then Truvada is in there, again, the Tenofovir and um, the, the potential for use with people with uh, other integrase inhibitor mutations, the potential for uh, use with people with multidrug resistant virus. I mean, I probably shouldn't say this on public access television, but um, I, I have a couple of patients who are on, for example, quad rilpivirine or quad darunavir, which is persistent, mm -hmm. which are not, you know, FDA approved or data driven uh, mm -hmm. decisions. They're decisions based mm -hmm. on what the patient can mm -hmm. tolerate best and what might work for them in their mm -hmm. particular situation. And uh, particularly the quad persista use, because you can get, get rid of Norvir altogether, which helps mm -hmm. with your fatty liver infiltration, your lipids and all that stuff, very fat, fat friendly regimen. And uh, the Darunavir now comes in an 800 milligram tablet, so you're basically down to two tablets once a day for someone mm -hmm. who previously has probably been on a deep salvage regimen mm -hmm. with multiple pills and multiple drugs. So it's, to me, it's, it's, and so I'm looking forward to data about its use with mm -hmm. um, antiretroviral experienced mm -hmm. uh, patients. How, how, how uh, important do you feel is, you know, you have a lot of patients in your practice and how important do you feel it is, is that the patients have low pill burden that we look for, for instance, now there's the potential for drugs coming down the line. Yes. It might be once a month injection or something yeah. like that. I, it, I think simplification is critical. It's yeah. especially maybe more so now when yeah. we become, the, the, the epidemic is no longer as drought dramatic and maybe the patients don't see this as, as important, and you really hate for somebody to miss their drugs. Right. And do you see resistance uh, problems in switching drugs then still, or are people becoming, realizing no. the importance of commitment? Yeah, I, I think so. And the, the other thing is that the, the regimens, the modern-day regimens, of course, are fully suppressive. Mm -hmm. The way we got to multidrug resistance was through, you know, essentially evolution mm -hmm. of the antiretroviral therapy for HIV mm -hmm. because we started out basically with monotherapy mm -hmm. with AZT and then we added 3TC or D4T or DDI or Crixivan or whatever came along. So it really became serial monotherapy. So mm -hmm. patients were never fully suppressed. They had already pinged off uh, thymidine analog mutations, 184B and soon you know multiple PI mutations. So it was really out of our lack of knowledge or understanding of how uh, mm -hmm. the, the importance of combining at least two classes, three drugs that are fully suppressive. Mm -hmm. And so we no longer, you know, to me, multidrug resistant virus was really not a, an issue from my perspective, never was, of patient failure uh, or lack of adherence or cooperation mm -hmm. or whatever term you like to use. Uh, compliance is old school. Mm -hmm. um, it was a failure of the system, the medical healthcare mm -hmm. system, to know what appropriate treatments were. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, um, almost all regimens are fully suppressive. We pre test everybody who's naive with a genotype so we know if they've inherited or 
received resistance mutations from their source case and then design an antiretroviral therapy program that will be fully suppressive for them. So I rarely, I mean, I rarely if ever see resistance mutations based solely on lack of adherence. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat of that is the integrase inhibitors because a lot mm -hmm. of people jumped on board with, say, Trivada Isentris mm -hmm. or Trivada um, Atravarine and Rotegravir. And the non-nucleosides and the integrase inhibitors are, again, are very vulnerable drugs or what people call fragile. Um, they have very low genetic barriers to the development of resistance. So um, you miss a couple of dosages here and there, and it can be enough for your blood level to drop. So we unfortunately, I think in the early days of jumping on the integrase inhibitor bandwagon and the novel non-nucleosides um, have, you know, again, we've gotten new mutations that are... Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and the problem with Roltegravir resistance is it generally r renders the person Elvitegravir resistant as well. We, we still don't have the complete picture on the Dolutegravir, which is the third of the integrase inhibitors that's still not mm -hmm. uh, met with FDA approval. Is there anything at the CROI that, or anything you anticipate viewing at the CROI, you already mentioned a few, that you're actually going to be looking closely at or, or excited about seeing or, or just take it as it comes, because I know there's so much that goes down in the last, in the right, last hours. Right, right. Well, I mean, I'm always interested in new antiretroviral therapies and also the ongoing, you know, we'll be seeing probably some 48 and 96 week data on some of the drugs that exist and that we are using. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said earlier, I'm hopeful that we'll see some novel uses of particularly Strivild in mm -hmm. um, uh, antiretroviral experienced patients. My per personal interests, of course, I'm very interested in um, uh, non-AIDS related malignancies, mm -hmm. which um, I'm not particularly fond of the name because I think they are AIDS related, but yeah. <laughs> uh, they're not like our traditional opportunistic malignancies, right. uh, which we knew back in the day, right. particularly Kaposi sarcoma and uh, right. lymphoma. Right. But, we're, uh, and we're going to cover those any, anyway in the other right. program because we, yeah. we really do want to do another program which will cover more the associated diseases or okay. comorbidities and and uh, it's it's hard. I mean, you're you're really talking uh, broadly about this conference because it's it is amazingly huge. It is huge, and it might be good at this time to kind of give a sense of the proportions at this conference. Uh, the draw is is probably huge, but. I know a lot of the docs don't go. They can't all go because right. there's not room. <laughs> right. Yeah, the only, uh, usually the census is about 4,000, I think, is mm -hmm. how many enrollees they take. And, um, you know, it is it is basic science, which to me mm -hmm. is always interesting because it's mm -hmm. good to listen to the people who are actually conducting the bench research. Very different perspective than me as a primary care clinician for people living with You're at the opposite end of the Right, I'm the completely the other end of the continuum, right? Yeah. I'm at the tail end of their work. So that's good. And they do tend to draw a lot of basic scientists from mm -hmm. around the world. Matter of fact, you're one of the uh, admission requirements for a, for a uh, um, you know, the participant is that they actively be engaged in mm -hmm. HIV related mm -hmm. research activities, mm -hmm. which fortunately, because of my anal dysplasia work and r and &E, and then Kaiser has a couple of uh, drug-related uh, co-infected studies with Hep B going mm -hmm. on, too, which I'm a sub-I on, so um, mm -hmm. that helps me get in. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and it is international. It's the only scientific meeting that's been held in the United States on a regular basis, mm -hmm. which is of historic interest. Uh, and it is held annually. I don't remember if this is the 20th or 21st. It is the 20th. 20th, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've had the good fortune to attend a number of them, right. well, I, <laughs> which I know, is a blessing. <laughs> I know the docs in Portland are always eager to go. And, and yeah. The, but there I, is this sense now that uh, as, a, as a, a clinician or as a scientist, it doesn't matter. You don't really have to go to get almost all of the information, except for the hall talk, which is right. Which is, I mean, it is it is true. 
you can, I mean, you can get most of the stuff online. They have CDs, uh, um, you know, you, you can watch the sessions live at the time remotely mm -hmm. from anywhere in the world. Um, uh, from my perspective, I, I agree with you, friend. I mean, my perspective is the hobnobbing. I mean, I like to talk to people in the hallway and I, I am particularly fond of the poster sessions and most mm -hmm. people and would not. Get, that's the peer review process. Right. Can and, you explain that a little further? So Sure. So they have every day, every afternoon, they'll have uh, poster sessions and there's different topics each day. And the, the person representing that poster who's presenting that poster usually has about a two hour stint that they stand by the poster. And then, you know, people just mill up and down the aisle ways and you can talk directly to that person who's representing that research. And, a lot of times there's just very novel, you know, proof of concept kinds of things and, and just a whole wide variety. I mean, there's things that are super basic science, molecular biology kinds of things all the way to, mm -hmm. you know, epidemiology, general population science, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of people I know, in at least my peers in terms of clinicians, that whole thing just wears them out it's just like they it's just, a mind suck it's just like <laughs> whoa dude and and it's true i mean i'm exhausted by the end of the afternoon and my yeah. feet hurt and yeah. i just want to have a cup of coffee and right. sit with my feet up someplace but i i get a lot out of it and and of course i'm rabid about even going through the um you know course syllabus and stuff and looking at some of the poster presentations because yeah. you can't possibly get to all of them and there's literally i don't know how many i think they because i applied last year to have my poster and uh what did they say they had um 1700 oh i don't remember now but some massive number of applicants yeah. and they yeah. only accept like you know about yeah. you know 60 70 percent of the posters that apply for presentation so uh, but it's it is massive to, to get through it I I tend to um, to read the discussion or the the uh, conclusions first. yes and then that way I see whether it's something that I want really to want to look at the data yeah because yeah. yeah. it, it, it really and of course it it doesn't always represent what it should in some cases but that's part of the process they, they right. draw a conclusion they believe and and you right. really have to define whether that's accepted by the community. Yeah, exactly. The docs and so yeah, on. and it well, and it's interesting because in the same aisle way under the same topic, you could find two or three papers that say Something two or like different that, yeah. two or three different things, and so that's mm -hmm. what I kind of like about it because there is no, you know, it's not a definitive proof. These are these are concepts, these are ideas that people are investigating, and mm -hmm. you know they may be replicated and they may not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of it, I guess, when you can replicate something and it's a little more provable than, right. than just to say right. this if is everybody's a getting the same yeah. results. results. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah, I've, I've often interviewed bench scientists and, and most of the time they're also excited about what, what may happen to the work that they do at some point. But um, it is bench science. It's very boring, I guess, to some people. but. Um, it seems very, it holds a lot of interest. The rooms are always filled. Oh, yeah. In fact, some of the, the most exciting, or I shouldn't say exciting, but just the most interesting rooms uh, or, or presentations are some of the most complex. And I mean, I've seen our local docs sit there and we're all scratching our heads when we leave, but yeah. we, we tried really hard to get what we yeah. could out of it because yeah. it's, it's very complex science. It or, is. And it's new. It's new, uh, new uh, science that's moving right. forward. Right. They're making a lot of discoveries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I always try to go to like the um, neuro aids discussions, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of times I'm sitting there going, Phew, "Yeah, <laughs> that's way." But that's but when you say that, that's really important to yeah. consider. I mean, neuro, yeah. neuropsychological is, is right. I mean, we, we're worried about are the antiretrovirals going through the blood brain barrier and so forth. So, those are some of the questions people need to ask and and inquire about the new drugs that are coming down. Well, I, I think we probably covered what we needed to. I think this is a teaser. It uh, hopefully gets people excited about the possibility of either going online and watching it or watching the reviews that, that I far right. will create. Um, some of our programs will be on thebody.com and uh, in many other sites across the country because we've shared our opportunities for people to 
to experience the interview process with us at the Croy. That we have, I think, thirty interview, thirty or roughly thirty um, young invest, not young investigators, uh, community educators. Oh, nice. Yeah, who are going to some of them participate with us in answer, asking questions of the the various people in some cases in their own languages because there's a number of probably about a third of them are going to be speaking other languages mm -hmm. so that should be interesting at least especially for the people who are going to maybe hear about the croix the first time in some unusual language you know yeah that, that we're not usually familiar with uh but i appreciate you you taking the time and i and i would invite people to watch the other piece which is going to be more focused at comorbidities and and or their co-diseases if you will and in uh, the meantime, we thank you, Jim McDonald, for sure. appearing here. And uh, be sure to watch the other program.